So New York City has now officially entered the summer of hell, created by long overdue maintenance work around Penn Station. This work is going to reduce commuter access to this vital hub by 20% for the half million commutes daily. A couple of weeks ago in New York, the derailment of an A train left dozens injured and disrupted hundreds of thousands of trips. In two years, the planned shutdown of the L train will disrupt 200,000 daily trips for a year and a half. Today, New York City's subway delays are two and a half times what they were just five years ago. It's clear that transportation in America's leading city is at the breaking point. And this should be no surprise to anyone who's followed the lack of infrastructure investment over the past decades, particularly to Lyndon LaRouche, who fought against the 1970s destruction and underinvestment in New York City and the Big Mac Municipal Assistance Corporation financial dictatorship that took it over. Many of the immediately needed fixes are totally obvious to anyone familiar with the situation. Replace the hundred-year-old tunnels crossing the Hudson and East Rivers. Upgrade the switching equipment that dates back to Franklin Roosevelt's presidency. And increase maintenance and repair overhaul of track and equipment. But what's really required is a longer-term perspective of the next level of infrastructure, the long-term perspective whose absence caused the crisis that we now find ourselves in, a crisis in which New York City is merely a leading example in the United States. Without fighting to win a commitment to such a long-term perspective for a new platform, any short-term fixes, even needed ones, will just be kicking the can down the road. To make that long-term perspective clear, let's look at what we can learn from Africa and China. With some exceptions of the more developed nations, such as Egypt and South Africa, African infrastructure is at a pitifully underdeveloped level. Consider these figures. The total shipment of freight by rail. In Africa, it's less than 10% what it is in the United States, China, or Europe. Consider per capita energy consumption in Africa, only 10% that of the U.S., only one-third that of China. It's more clear when we focus on the higher form of energy represented by electricity, by electrical energy. Per capita use in Africa is only 6% what it is in the United States, and only one-fourth that of China. In fact, less than half of Africans have reliable access to electricity at all. A typical U.S. refrigerator uses more than double the average electricity use of citizens of Nigeria or Kenya. With such an insufficient infrastructure platform, extensive economic progress is simply impossible. Yet some people, and by some people I mean Africa's former colonial masters, led by the British, they say that African development should be through appropriate technologies, that an incremental approach to improvement should be taken, that foot-powered pumps for water or solar panels on a hut would be a useful upgrade. That is nonsense. For example, the pathetic Power Africa plan proposed by President Obama, it would hardly make a dent in the outrageously low levels of development. It's going to be your generation uh, that suffers the most. Uh, Ultimately, if you think about all the youth that everybody's mentioned here in Africa, if everybody's raising living standards to the point where everybody's got a car and everybody's got air conditioning and everybody's got a big house, uh, well, the planet will boil over. Africa must leap ahead, not crawl forward. And this can happen. The Congo River itself could support an estimated 100,000 megawatts of electricity enough for 100 million people or more, with 40,000 megawatts from the planned Grand Inga Dam alone. The Transaqua Water Transfer Program, which would use water from the Congo and its tributaries to refill and to provide navigation to Lake Chad, which is currently drying up, this would be larger by an order of magnitude than any other water project in the world. The expansion of rail lines in Africa is currently at a world-leading level today. It's growing. New transportation routes across Africa will connect the hinterlands, allowing modern development. And this will change the situation 
from the current isolation of some landlocked regions of the continent. To give one example, the freight cost for bringing in a container of fertilizer from Singapore, to bring that into Rwanda or to Burundi, it's more than two and a half times the cost of bringing it to the port city of Alexandria in Egypt, due to the terrible, insufficient quality of overland transportation infrastructure across the continent. So by creating access to efficient transportation, regions benefit from the opportunities to bring in equipment and supplies, to export their products and ideas, for residents to travel. With the availability of electricity, higher productive capabilities are unlocked, and the value of the land and of the people increases. And some people recognize this. Unlike the outlook of the transatlantic world, China views Africa not simply as a source of raw materials, as a continent that's best kept in a state of underdevelopment, but as an opportunity for massive, rapid, intense overall economic development as potential partners in shared prosperity, as new markets, new collaborators. So while US or European investment stock in Africa is heavily oriented towards mining and resource extraction, Chinese investment goes primarily to infrastructure and small and medium-sized businesses. Back in 2010, Chinese trade with Africa overtook that of U.S. trade with Africa and is currently more than double the U.S.-African trade level. And China is financing big projects. The nearly 500-kilometer, 300-mile standard gauge railway in Kenya, built in only three years. The 750-kilometer, 500-mile Djibouti Addis Ababa rail line, which will be extended, it reduces travel time from days to hours as it whizzes by at 100 miles per hour. Such major investments, along with the future completion of the Grand Inga Dam, of the Transaqua water system, they're going to completely transform the economy of Africa and each locality within it, bringing water, power, transportation access, allowing a higher level of industry, mining, agriculture, scientific and cultural pursuits. Productivity will grow. So now, return to New York City. What has been missing in New York City? Maintenance? No. What's been missing is a commitment to discovering and building the next platform of infrastructure for the region. In the context of a national credit system, of federal high-speed rail authority work, of upgraded and reliable waterways, of high-tech new designs of nuclear plants, and all of these potentially built with international cooperation. In this context, how does New York City fit in this broader area that it exists in? Where will the next generation of transportation and development hubs lie? And upon what technologies will they be based? How can magnetic levitation technology, how can this change our view of transportation? How will commercial fusion power realized within a decade by a fully funded research program, how could this change our relationship to power, to materials, to production, to transportation? How will the expanded availability of water, power, and transport open new areas of the country to development and higher types of development? How will the Bering Strait connection change world freight flows? Will New York City even still be the nation's leading metropolis in a century? So, sure. Fix the L train. Yes, rebuild the Hudson River tunnels. Absolutely, redo the disaster known as Penn Station. But do it all in a national and international context, a context of a future orientation of an economic outlook to the value of leapfrogging to a higher infrastructure platform. So as in the future, our National High Speed Rail Authority builds a 300 mile per hour train system starting across the Northeast, as transit and cities are upgraded to allow for commutes of half an hour rather than an hour and a half, as the World Land Bridge connects to North America, allowing land travel from New York to Beijing, from North America to Asia, as all this takes place, what totally new projects will take place in New York City? What will be its future and what will be its mission? The mistake of the past was failing to have a future and that error must end.